Hello, everyone. Do you know Immanuel Kant? He is a well-known philosopher, but his thought can be difficult to summarize. Kant, a major figure of the 18th century and the German Enlightenment, wrote on various topics, including a notable work, What is Enlightenment?, published in 1784. In this text, he defines the Enlightenment as the process by which humanity emerges from its own intellectual and moral minority, a pivotal moment when it begins to think autonomously, thereby escaping authoritarian control. A mnemonic to link Kant to this era is the Age of Majority, set at 18 years in France, symbolizing humanity's entry into an era of intellectual maturity in the 18th century. Kant is also famous for his work, Critique of Pure Reason, a central piece of modern philosophy that explores knowledge. While complex, this work proposes a balance between the rationalism of Descartes and other thought currents, emphasizing the importance of logic and reason. Kant combined Cartesian rationalism, which focuses on ideas prior to experience, with the empiricism of David Hume, which values sensory experience. His encounter with Hume's ideas awakened him from a dogmatic slumber, making him realize that knowledge is neither reduced to pure logic nor the world of platonic ideas, but also includes experience and sensory interaction with the world. Kant integrated this experimental dimension in his Critique of Pure Reason, published in 1781 and revised in 1787. Kant is also renowned for his moral philosophy, particularly outlined in Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals. His life was characterized by a strict routine and an aversion to the unexpected, reflecting an austere personality that valued order and principles, traits that permeate his moral philosophy. Although a Protestant, Kant did not let his religious convictions influence his philosophical system, including his morals. He based his moral concept on rational philosophical principles rather than religious justifications, thus asserting reason as essential to humanity. This approach is clearly manifested in his Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, where he explores the underlying principles of morality. In Groundwork of the Metaphysics of Morals, Kant delves into the construction of morality, positing the concept of the categorical imperative as a cornerstone. This imperative represents the universal moral principle guiding human actions, dictating the conduct to be adopted regardless of circumstances. Morality, in general, is a set of norms and rules that guide towards good, operating on the distinction between good and evil. Without these notions, the moral framework collapses. However, the subjectivity of these concepts leads to disagreements, highlighting the complexity of universally defining good and evil. Kantian morality is distinguished notably by its rejection of utilitarianism, which judges actions based on their consequences, often evaluated in terms of pleasure or pain generated. Kant, on the contrary, insists on adopting moral principles that transcend immediate outcomes, centering human conduct on unconditional ethical norms. According to utilitarianism, an action is deemed morally good if it generates more pleasure than pain for the majority. This approach evaluates the morality of an action based on its results in terms of welfare or suffering. In contrast, Kant finds this perspective reductive and categorically rejects it, positioning himself as a proponent of deontology, which values the principles and intentions behind actions. For Kant, Morality is not measured by the consequences of actions, but by the conformity of these actions with universal moral principles. In his system, an action is considered morally good if it is motivated by a will aligned with the good, regardless of its practical effects. Thus, it is not the conformity to a moral law that makes an action good, but the intention to respect that law. To illustrate Kantian thought, consider the example of a bank robber who hesitates before committing the act. This hesitation might reflect a consideration of the morality of his action, which, according to Kant, is significant for evaluating the morality of the act itself. The bank robber hesitates not due to a moral sense, but because of fear of the consequences, such as arrest and imprisonment. His thought process is guided by risk assessment, not by moral inclination or a good conscience. If his decision to abandon the theft is motivated by the fear of prison, for Kant, this does not constitute a moral action. The robber acts in accordance with the good, but without being motivated by the intrinsic morality of the act. 
Kant strongly criticizes mere conformity to moral norms that is not supported by a genuine intention to do good. He distinguishes between acting according to morality and acting from morality, rejecting the hypocritical attitude of appearing to act well while pursuing selfish interests. This critique raises the difficulty of discerning the true motivations behind actions, questioning the sincerity of moral intention. In the example of giving to a beggar, the question is whether the act is motivated by a sincere desire to help or simply to ease one's conscience, illustrating the dilemma between authentic altruism and self-satisfaction disguised as generosity. Kantian morality centers on intention and goodwill, but it is not limited to these alone. Intention must be combined with the notion of moral law, which, according to Kant, guides our actions. Unlike moral conceptions that view the good as a transcendent entity, often illustrated in religious approaches, Kant argues that moral law is not dictated by an external authority. For Kant, this moral law is intrinsic to each individual, embodied by what he calls moral reason, distinguishing humans from other living beings. Each person carries within them this inner moral authority, an innate principle of the good, dictating the conduct to follow. This perspective has elicited criticisms, particularly regarding the origin of moral values, often seen as the result of education and culture, rather than an innate presence in each individual. In different cultures, what is considered moral or immoral varies, highlighting that morality is not universal, but culturally and historically specific. What we consider moral today may differ greatly from past norms. Moral standards change over time and vary from one place to another, illustrating Pascal's concept, truth on this side of the Pyrenees, error beyond. However, this variability does not invalidate Kant's view of morality. Kant proposes a conception of morality as a formal, universal framework capable of transcending cultural specifics. According to him, all humans share an innate moral law, but its practical manifestation may differ. The idea of universal education serves as an analogy. Although the concept of education is global, educational methods and content vary across the world. Similarly, Kant's moral law is characterized by its universality and innateness. Kant seeks to explicitly articulate this moral law, often perceived intuitively or unconsciously, through his concept of the categorical imperative. He formulates this moral principle by urging to act according to a maxim that could be elevated to the status of a universal law, emphasizing the importance of principles applicable to all, regardless of cultural contexts. Kantian morality is essentially formal, leading some critics to question the use of the term Kantian morality. Kant does not provide a set of moral rules, but rather a framework for evaluating morality. This moral framework is based on the idea that the morality of an action depends on our willingness to generalize the principles motivating it to all humanity. In other words, before acting, one should ask whether the principle guiding us could, ideally, direct all human beings. It is the ability to want to universalize the basis of our actions that constitutes the criterion of morality in Kant, known as the universalizability test. This process differs from the consequentialist maxim, do not do to others what you would not want them to do to you, which judges actions based on their potentially negative consequences for oneself. This approach is more a morality of prudence than a reflection on the intrinsic morality of the action. Kant challenges us with this approach by not explicitly prescribing what is morally good or bad, but by urging us to reflect on the universality of our action principles. This reflection does not directly determine which actions are good or bad, nor which values to embody, but proposes a criterion for evaluating the moral validity of our intentions and actions. Kant's morality is not limited to abstractions. It is anchored in the notion of human dignity, elucidated in the second formulation of the categorical imperative. This formulation emphasizes that we must treat humanity, in ourselves and in others, always as an end in itself, never merely as a means. This guides us toward a concept of moral action led by dignity, inherent in humanity due to our capacity for moral reasoning. Dignity, according to Kant, stems from this unique ability of humans to assess the morality of their acts. Despite criticisms, particularly from utilitarians, who see dignity as an abstraction without material basis, Kant maintains that humans, endowed with moral reason, possess an intrinsic value he calls dignity, 
in contrast to inanimate objects, which have a price but no dignity. Kant thus establishes a clear distinction between the intrinsic value of human beings, who possess dignity, and that of objects, which have a price. This distinction is essential to his categorical imperative, affirming that an action is morally good if it respects humanity as an end in itself, refusing to treat it as a means to achieve our own ends. Hence, Kant moves beyond his first formulation by explicitly incorporating the principle of human dignity into his moral theory. Kant posits that our behavior should be guided by the principle of treating oneself and others not as means, but as ends in themselves, thus respecting the intrinsic dignity of each individual. This dignity is based on the recognition of our value beyond that of objects, attributing a special importance and meaning to our existence, founded on our ability to discern right from wrong. To act morally, according to Kant, means to act in accordance with this recognition of oneself as a member of humanity, while to act immorally is to marginalize oneself from this human community. Kantian morality demands strict adherence to ethical principles without compromise with personal conscience, emphasizing the non-negotiability of morality. However, some critics, like Charles Peguy, have perceived Kantian morality as too ideal and distant from the complex and often contradictory realities of everyday life, where moral dilemmas abound. For example, the situation of a terminally ill person being kept alive artificially raises a moral dilemma about preserving life versus alleviating suffering, each of these options having profound implications on the concept of human dignity. The value of human life lies in its dignity, raising the question of whether this dignity is preserved when unnecessary suffering is inflicted. In the case of a suffering patient kept alive, there is a risk of compromising human dignity under the guise of protecting it, posing the dilemma of potentially doing harm in seeking to do good. This contradiction illustrates a possible critique of Kantian morality, which focuses on the purity of intention, sometimes at odds with the moral complexities of real life. Kantian morality, centered on intention and principles, can lead to actions taken without consideration for the consequences of those actions, as consequences are not a moral judgment criterion in his system. Kant condemns lying in all circumstances, considering it a way of treating others not as ends in themselves with dignity, but as means to achieve one's own ends. According to this view, lying is always unacceptable, even in situations where the truth could cause direct harm. For instance, faced with a criminal seeking their victim, Kant suggests we must tell the truth, as lying would amount to manipulating others for one's own interests, thereby violating the principle of treating others as ends in themselves and not as means. Strict adherence to Kant's categorical imperative can lead to problematic situations, reflecting a form of moral idealism considered detached from reality by many later philosophers. This perception has contributed to a frequently negative view of morality, associated with constraints and a certain rigidity, or even perceived as dogmatic moralism. So the term morality evokes strict rules and judgment based on abstract principles considered universal, but applied unevenly, often more harshly towards others than towards oneself. In reaction to this connotation, the concept of ethics has developed, offering an approach perceived as more flexible and personal. Ethics involves principles of action that are not exclusively dictated by a strict dichotomy of good and evil, but allow for a spectrum of moral nuances. This distinction between morality and ethics suggests that notions of good and evil can vary, forming a continuum rather than a binary opposition. In this context, Kantian morality itself can be seen as a system to be questioned, inviting autonomy, independence, and individual responsibility, rather than blind obedience to absolute rules. Kant, by declaring the Enlightenment as the era of humanity's maturity, might have viewed his moral philosophy, though rigid, as a pathway to a more mature and responsible approach to morality. This vision is not limited to judging actions based on their conformity to good or evil, but encourages introspection on our intentions and motivations, on the elements that animate our conscience. Acting morally could thus mean exploring what guides us internally, rather than merely aligning our actions with cultural norms of good and evil. It is up to each individual to explore these personal moral questions, and I hope this discussion will stimulate thought and dialogue. 
I invite you to share your thoughts, to like, comment, and follow the discussions on social media. Thank you to the donors who support this channel as your presence and contribution are crucial to its existence. See you soon for a new video, and until then, continue to think and question.